Thanks, Hank. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. It's so nice to be able to say that. Uh, I left Hawaii uh, yesterday, and it was about what temperature? 82, 82, 83, and sunny. And so uh, it's it's great to be here, and it's great to be back at SNA. It's a uh, um, it's, I've had a, a long time affiliation with this uh, great organization. I, I had to uh, kind of worked in the trenches on this when I was the deputy director of surface warfare with Mark Edwards and I think Harry uh, Ulrich and I were, and all of us were at that time. I think it was in 76 in those days and now it's in 96. And so I don't know what it'll be next century. I don't know if we can add any more numbers to that without making the doors bigger in the Pentagon. But um, it's uh, this particular forum uh, has for many, many years uh, proven to be a great opportunity for, first of all, for us all to get together and uh, remember the good old days and to think about the future. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to look in our wake or to glimpse in our wake. Of course, you know, we don't ever want to steer by our wake, but we want to also spend time in, in, during these precious days looking into the future and what that future holds. So I think what I was asked to come here to talk to you today was not about fleet readiness and not about uh, the, the difficulty of sequestration and how the money and the readiness, even though you can ask me those questions because I'm the ultimate consumer of, of the readiness of the fleet today as a, as a COCOM. But to kind of give you my uh, general impressions of what's happening in the Pacific, uh, in the, what I now call the Indo-Asia Pacific, of course, the academics beat me up about that. They say, well, what does that really mean? I say, I don't know. I'm a surface warfare officer. It doesn't matter. I'm not an academic. Uh, what it means for me, though, is that, as you know, the Pacific Command uh, has always been held by a Navy uh, four-star. Uh, it has uh, it's the oldest COCOM that we have, and geographically, it's the largest COCOM. It covers about 52% of the world. My uh, particular uh, field of play each day is from Hollywood to Bollywood is the way I describe it, and kind of from the, as far north as you want to go and far south as you need to go. So uh, in that particular, let me frame for you a little bit about how you need to think about the, the Indo-Asia Pacific and then to start to reflect on the implications of that for the future of surface warfare. Uh, first, it is the, um, the most populated part of the world. How many people in the world today? About 7 billion people. That's projected to grow to 9 or 10 billion in this century. And in that period of time, about 7 out of every 10 people are projected to live in what I call Hollywood to Bollywood, Indo-Asia Pacific. 7 out of 10 people. Uh, in this area are the largest uh, countries in the world, most populated countries. Uh, China, uh, India. Uh, there are the largest economies in the world. Three of the four largest economies are in this part of the world. It is the economic engine that drives the world today. It is the economic engine. Uh, over half of everything that moves on the surface of the earth generates out of the Indo-Asia Pacific, and that number is growing. So, you know, we always talk about, well, 90% of everything in the world flows on the surface by something, right? Well, that's true. That has been true for a long time. But what is changing is that over the last couple of decades, uh, the number, the amount of things in that 90% has quadrupled. So every big screen TV, uh, everything that you can go to Walmart and walk down any aisle that pumps into the global economy flows in this part of the world. In the South China Sea alone, over half of all the energy supplies afloat every day move through the South China Sea. So I know we, the service warriors, we've all spent time in the Straits of Hormuz and pining over that problem. But the problem is equally or more acute in that, this part of the world as we go forward. Uh, it is the, um, the world's largest democracies are here. The world's largest Islamic democracy. The world's smallest republic are here. Five of our seven treaty allies are here. When I took this job, I got asked, who are our treaty allies? I won't give you a quiz. How many treaties do we have? Anybody know the answer to that? There's about seven treaties. Five of the, those treaties' allies are predominantly in the PACOM AOR, and many of them are historic. Our oldest ally, Thailand, 181 years this year, is an ally. 
And many of them have been brought, bought through uh, many years of uh, working together, and some of them were spawned by things like World War II that left us with a, left us with a world that needed to be reshaped through those alliances. And those alliances continue to be strong and important in the, in the, the Asia Pacific we see it today. Um, it also is the most militarized area in the world. The most militarized area in the world. I know that's hard sometimes watching the, 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 the international news every night to grasp this because we always have been focused for the last couple of decades on a Middle East-centric look for a lot of good reasons. But seven of the ten largest armies in the world are in my AOR. All of the largest and most capable navies in the world are in my area of responsibility. Five of the world's declared nuclear powers are in the 36 countries that I look at. So it's a, also a region that doesn't have the historic mechanisms in place to be able to help you control what happens in the security environment. So there is not a NATO. I mean, think about NATO. We spent a lot of time, I mean, I just came from NATO to this job. I love NATO. Uh, had pretty good experience with NATO. But uh, if you take the United States out of NATO, all of Europe's 500 million people. I mean, 500 million people is not even a drop in the bucket in Southeast Asia. There's 170 million people or so in, Bang in uh, Bangladesh. There's 200 million in Indonesia. So starting to get the scale of complexity of what this part of the world means to us as a nation and the implications for what it means to our military and, and our Navy. So let me just talk about some of the challenges here. So think about this Hollywood to Bollywood. Think about all these people. Think about the center of uh, energy or the center of gravity for our global economy. Uh, think about uh, largest world's largest Islamic democracy. Uh, think about um, uh, a, a general sense of terrorism. My sense of terrorism in this part of the world is that it, it is a problem. I mean, more IEDs go off of my AOR every day or every month than anywhere else in the world. Okay. But they're just in a large area, so they get consumed by, by the depth of it. Uh, but my take on the terrorism is that we have it. Uh, but it's different than the Middle East. Uh, someone has uh, enlightened me that, that uh, radicalism, uh, particularly that spawned by radical Islam, uh, came to the Middle East via sword and it came uh, to the Asia Pacific via merchants. And so it does play out differently in this part of the world. So I think from a terrorist perspective that we're probably in the front end of the problem rather than the tail end of the problem, which we are in other parts of the world, which means we have an opportunity, I think, to shape that environment uh, if we uh, stay engaged and we do it right. But what are some of the challenges? Uh, I have a Center for Excellence that works for me uh, called uh, HADR Center of Excellence. So when I showed up as PACOM, I said, well, why do I own this thing? I mean, it's one of those, you know, admin things. You could say, well, why do I have this command under me? Well, it was quick to point out to me that 80% of all natural disasters in the world happen in my AOR. 80%. And the impact on humanity because of the, the numbers of people and where they live, which many of them live in the littorals, and a growing number live in the littorals, the impact of these on humanity is significant. So there's uh, veterans here of the Tomodachi. There's the veterans of Aceh. Uh, there are veterans of just probably recently of the Philippine uh, effort we did in uh, Operation Damian uh, in the central part of the Philippines. So the, the natural disaster piece is not going to go away. Uh, the implications of climate change. Now there's a raging debate around the world by scientists and everybody else about is there climate change. Uh, I'm not going to step into that argument with you. But what I can tell you is that the implications for weather, the implications for what's happening in the environment today because of the, the mass of humanity and where they live is becoming more and more important to the security environment particularly the security environment in my particular AOR. And that has to be thought through. Transnational threats, uh, terrorism, uh, drugs, most of the precursors for methamphetamines, which is a drug of choice today, uh, come out of my AOR. And, and you can't interdict drugs in the Pacific Ocean. You just can't do it. It's just too big. 
So you have to figure out what are the networks and what, where, how are the networks being fed, where's the money going, where's the money being funneled, and where are the implications for that money on our own security interest and the security of the American people. So we have that. So we have human trafficking. Uh, it's starting to get a lot more uh, play today in the, in the political environment. Uh, I think some of you heard me uh, show a, showed a slide before in another presentation I made a few months ago. A $30 billion a year industry in uh, human trafficking globally. $30 billion. It's more than uh, Google and Nike and Starbucks coffee all put together. And it's, it's not just uh, prostitutes, it's child labor, it's child prostitution, it's the whole nine yards. And uh, the source of much of that comes out of the PACOM AOR. So we're increasingly aware of the impact this has on the security environment. Of course, uh, there's competition for food and water, and that's going to grow. Uh, how fast will it grow? I don't know, but we're starting to see signs over the last couple of decades that this will be an impact on the security environment. Uh, there will be a uh, uh, historic territorial disputes. Now, you can almost read any newspaper any day and get a sense of what's happening in both the East China Sea, South China Sea, uh, as we look at the historical nature of how countries decide what belongs to them and what doesn't belong to them as they go into the future. And we can talk more about that in during question and answer if you'd like. And of course, there's an increasingly dangerous North Korea. Uh, people ask me, what do you worry about the most uh, day to day? And I worry about the unpredictability of a, uh, of a North Korea, Kim Jong-un, uh, and the capability he has to basically uh, not only threaten our, our homeland, but put a serious uh, uh, cataclysmic event in place on the Korean Peninsula, which uh, would uh, quite literally disrupt the entire world. Uh, the flash to bang for what can happen in Korea is very, very, very short. And so as you think about the implications for foreign naval forces and the, what you provide and what you, what you don't provide, you have to think about Korea. I think to some degree we have uh, put Korea on the back burner for the last couple of decades because we were dealing with the more uh, urgent issues. And I think that the fact that we put it on the back burner has not put us in a good position where we are today. So we're going to have to think through what the future holds here and how we're going to manage the future with a North Korea that has a potential to threaten our homeland with weapons of mass destruction. And of course there is a rising India. Now many of you have operated like I have with the Indians for a long time and we're making good progress with the Indian, particularly the Indian Navy to Navy to U.S. Navy relationship. We want to see that continue. So part of the rebalance to the Asia Pacific the, one of the things I was directed to do by the president was to improve that relationship with India. So we built a long-term, deeper strategic relationship with them that allows them to have a significant role of the security environment, particularly the maritime security environment uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, which has, again, is one of those areas where we haven't paid a lot of attention to in the last, uh, last number of decades. And then there's the rise of China. So how will China show up? Uh, China is going to rise. Uh, we've all known this for a long time. Uh, in fact, we've all been, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years in our planning, we've been thinking about how will China show up? How will they show up as a, as a world leader? How will they show up as a global uh, economic power? And how will they contribute to the security environment? And that's yet to play out. But the goal, the PACOM goal, my goal is for China to eventually be a net a provider of security and not a net user of security. We'll see. We'll see. So how China and India rise has to be figured into it. And then finally, um, I would say that we're seeing today throughout the periphery of PACOM uh, the struggling, uh, the struggle of um, fragile democracies as, the, as those democratic processes and systems have been put in place in some of the countries in my AOR, they are yet today dealing with how to, uh, how to properly use democracy and, and to, to, to align their governments and their security apparatuses in a way 
that allows them to live through democratic reforms that their countries are going through today. So we're watching that. And I guess then, most importantly, about the challenges we have in the, in the Pacific AOR is what's the U.S. role going to be this century? What, how are we going to be involved here? Uh, I think uh, the President, in fact I know uh, because we, we made the recommendation to him when he signed out his, his uh, strategy in 2012, which articulated the pivot, so to speak, right? Pivot to the Asia Pacific. And the underlying thing behind that whole, the whole pivot is that after two decades of really difficult work in the Middle East, we have to look globally at where our, our long-term national interests. So where are our children and our grandchildren's, uh, where, are, where are their interests going to be most important? And the continuing vector, the consistent vector, is in the long term is to make sure we get it right in the Asia Pacific. So this is what has led to the pivot and the initiatives about the pivot and those initiatives inside the U.S. Navy that have led to that. So. Am I, am I lose? Are y'all trying to tell me something here by turning those lights off? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so let's look a little bit in our wake in the, in the PACOM AOR. Uh, so the surface Navy has had FDNF uh, for a long time here, there, right? Marines, Navy, Marine Corps team. Uh, I asked my staff the other day to tell me how much the presence in FDF had changed over time. You know, go back. 30 years, tell me how much it changed. And the answer was it hadn't changed much. It's within a couple of percentage points, it's about the same over time. Uh, and that's fine, and they've done great work. We put our best ships forward, our best submarines, our best amphibs. Uh, I think that we have uh, pushed readiness in the direction of FDNF in a way that has allowed them to realize a significant amount of success over those years. But it's not the same neighborhood as it was 20, 30 years ago. It's a different neighborhood, and it's changing. Um, and during that time, though, the surface Navy has been the backbone of maritime security in this AOR. It has been the backbone. Now, all the joint services come together, but on a day-to-day -day basis, if you think about my AOR, just think about the Pacific Ocean alone. What's the largest object on the face of the Earth? Pacific Ocean. For if you hadn't looked at it, you can take all the continents, all the land masses in the world, and jam them in together. Just pack them together, and you can put them right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and still have room for two more continents, a North America and, a, and an Africa. That's how big just the Pacific Ocean is. Then you add Indian Ocean to it, and you got, it just starts to really start to be amazing. So the surface Navy has been, I think, uh, a, a tremendous supporter leading the way in a number of areas. Um, one is uh, ballistic missile defense. In my previous jobs, I advocated pretty hard for the Navy to kind of get into the BMD uh, in the right way. Now, I'm not a BMD expert, but I, I think that I had good counsel for many of you in the room that we needed to up our game in how we did it and, we, we, and how we played in it, and we've done that. We've done that. And in fact, in, in every scenario, you see that the, the, the centerpiece of the most reliable piece of our BMD architecture lies on board the ships that are manned and equipped by the United States Navy and by, run by the young uh, men and women that run our fabulous ships. So we've done well on there. Um, we successfully adapted, I think, those ships to an ever-changing uh, security environment there where we're seeing uh, a proliferation of very quiet diesel submarines throughout this AOR. Uh, we're, we're seeing the proliferation of uh, higher, higher levels of technology and cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, and you, you pick it. It's just, uh, it's just escalating in, in almost every area. And thus far, uh, we've been able to, to match that. And our early Burks have been really the workhorse of that. Uh, I mean, it's a tremendous, if you think about it, it's a tremendous success in those Arleigh Burke ships through how many years of construction, how many flights, and their ability to, to continually be adapted to the scenarios that we're seeing uh, brought forward. So I think you have to give Surface Navy pretty high remarks for that. Uh, remarks for that. 
our mine forces that we put there, uh, I think, have remained relevant. And the introduction of littoral combat ship, I applaud the Service Navy for taking the chance to push that littoral combat ship early. Now, early is relative, okay? Uh, I like to tell this story. A few years ago, um, Admiral Meyer, when he was here in Crystal City, he would routinely call some of us over for counsel. Uh, I think I was a one star at that time. And he would call you in your room and then you'd have this dialogue about the Navy and how he felt about the Navy. And on one particular one of my come arounds, uh, he, uh, he, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, he said, that, I'm going to tell you about the 17 year locust. I said, well, what's the 17 year locust? He says, a 17 year locust, he said, that's how long it takes the United States from the time you think about a ship until it becomes operationally relevant is 17 years. I said, I don't believe it. So I started going back and I started calculating it, and he's about right. So we, the Navy, we, Service Navy, we set off down the road of littoral combat ship, and we said, we're going to do this in, Barry, how many years? Seven or eight? Four? Then we said seven. Then we had said eight. Then we said nine. Um, and we did do better, but we didn't do a whole lot better by my calculation. As I, as I think back on it, when I was with... Um, uh, Zambrowski and and uh, uh, back in the when I was an aide to the vice chief back in the night about 1998 uh, I happened to be in a room where uh, where they were talking about this this ship and this ship was going to be Street Fighter remember that and that quickly morphed to something beyond Street Fighter because that sounded really too angry I think for for the for the trade trade magazines but it went to Street Fighter. So that was 1998. So that, that about was a time, the genesis of the thinking of what littoral combat ship was going to be. It was going to be fast. It was going to be in the littorals. It was going to be multi-mission. It was going to be reconfigurable. It was going to have a small crew. It was going to do all these things. So that's 1998. So here we are, 15 years, 16 years. So you'll, you'll have really the first LCS show about 17 years later. But it's showing up with a whole different concept and a lot of different aspects of things that are going to make it, I think, a key player in the security environment in the world that I deal with, which has got a lot of littorals and a lot of interesting things going on in that. So as you go, now let's take a look at forward. So as you go forward, what's going to remain constant for surface warfare? Well, the world's not going to get any smaller. Now, it's getting smaller in other domains, cyber domain. I guess you could say the air, air domain is getting smaller. Um, but in our domain, it's not going to get any smaller. So you have to be there to be relevant. You know, having forces that are forward, having forces that are rotationally forward, having forces that can sustain themselves forward and be there is important for surface warfare. So I encourage us to resist any risk or any urge we have at all to sequester ourselves in some, some uh, quiet home port somewhere because our relevance will diminish because you can't get there fast enough. Because the world today, war, warfare in the world today is going to move too fast. And the surface Navy of the future has got to be on station, has got to be well trained, has got to be ready to do what it takes. So <clears throat> what else is going to remain the same? Um, Distance will be a tyranny. Logistics will remain a tyranny. Uh, we already uh, see, a, a, you know, we've got the smallest Navy since, what, 1916? In numbers, smallest Navy. Uh, capable Navy, is it big enough? Well, my testimony says it's not, okay? Some in this room may disagree. I say it's not big enough. It's not big enough for the world we're in and the way we deploy ships today in the emerging security environment. But that said, it is going to be, one of the things that remain constant, was we're going to struggle to maintain numbers because of the, the, uh, the implications of our budget, the implications of our industrial base, and our own, our, our own uh, proclivity to want to uh, take, take 17 years to build ships. And that gets expensive and it takes time. So that's going to remain a constant, I think. Um, but more important, I think, what remain constant is the importance of competent, well-trained and well-led people. Competent, well-trained and well-led people. Because in the end, 
Um, you know, we can stack up all the great Arleigh Burks and all the great Amphib ships and all the great LCSs and put them on into the, the pier, and they'll be a stack a mile high, but they don't matter if you don't have young men and women that can make them work and make them work in an increasingly difficult environment, increasingly challenging environment, a long ways away from our homeland. So, so what is changing? Well, our historic dominance that most of us in this room uh, have enjoyed is diminishing, no question. So let me say that again. Our historic dominance that for the, most of us during our careers have enjoyed is diminishing. Now, some of that's because of what we were able to do. We as a nation provided a security environment, particularly in the, in the, in the Asia Pacific area that allowed the rise of nations, that allowed the rise of economies, that allowed these, these economic miracles that are happening in some of our allies and partner countries. And this has generated uh, wealth, it's generated democracies, it's generated perspectives on security, and it's caused those nations to want to go to pursue their own, uh, their own um, security mechanisms. And when they do that, they take money and they buy and they invest in resources to buy defenses. And so it's, it's not unusual for us to, for me to sit here. I know it's going to be a, high, it's going to be a, a highlight that we're, our, our dominance is diminishing, but it's something we have known was going to happen and that we have to expect to continue to happen. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the future generation of service warfare officers have got to, I think, to pay more particular attention to the ability to show up on the scene and be lethal and be dominant, lethal and dominant, and to bring all the great aspects of, of information technology and warfare technology and all the things that our great country can produce for us and to be able to show up and to be lethal and dominant. We have to come to grips with those areas that we know we have vulnerabilities in. We have to come to grips with them, okay? And we can't wish them away. We can't wish them into the next generation. And there are some of those areas where we have to think hard about where are we being challenged by technology and what is our answer to that. Now every great generation in this generation of naval officers sitting here is as great as anyone that's ever been has acknowledged those challenges and then stepped up to them. The Wayne Myers of the world, the Hank Mustons of the world, uh, I could go on and just, just name them, that who said, hey, we have, a, we have an area here where we need to focus, we need to get after it, and the technology was found, and the resources were put in place. So I, I, I just say we need to think about this. We need to think about it. Um, but I'm proud of the readiness of the ships today, and I'm proud of the readiness that our surface warriors leadership has been able to provide and produce, particularly during this period of time we've gone through the the budget issues and the sequestration. So from where I sit as a PACOM commander, we have uh, about as ready a force with great ships as I've seen in a long time. Now, I hope that we continue that. But being, re being having good readiness is only one part of the equation. Uh, when you show up to the future fights that we envision, the future warfare scenarios, secu security scenarios that we envision in the 21st century, Many of them could emanate out of the PACOM AOR. We have to also show up and be relevant. Uh, to be honest with you, our lack of urgency on uh, development of the next generation of surface-launched uh, over-the-horizon cruise missiles is troubling. Uh, we, we're, 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 we're behind the need, and we need to think about that. We need to think about what is surface warfare's role in other than defensive operations. As a PACOM commander, I need you to be thinking in the offensive mode. I need you to be thinking, how are you going to show up? How are you going to be dominant? How are you going to be lethal? And that requires you to think about all scenarios, not just the ones that we've been, that we've been dealing with in the last several years where we have enjoyed basic air superiority, basic sea superiority. There's places in the world where in this century you won't have that. And whenever these magnificent $2 billion warships show up, they're going to have to be dominant. And they're going to have to have the tools to be dominant. 
We also have to look and, and embrace the value of asymmetric capabilities that we bring. Uh, we have to continue to pursue unmanned systems. They do bring a tremendous asymmetric advantage to me, to, pay, to commanders like me who have to deal with increasingly complex scenarios. Things like offensive mining need to be thought about. We haven't talked about a mining for a long time. In fact, it becomes, sometimes it becomes a, a stepsister to our dialogue in surface warfare. But surface warfare community, in my view, has to embrace the mine community, has to embrace this as an asymmetric, not only as a defensive capability, but as an asymmetric capability that allows us to be dominant in a battle space that may not, we may not always be dominant in when we enter. High-speed lift, important to me. How do, you, how do you get things around faster? This is a source surface warfare equity. Um, how do you use the systems that you have, the existing systems you have, in different ways? I think that there, we've shown that to be true with our Aegis systems and our ability to convert those to ballistic missile defense platforms. But we have a wide array of great systems that need to be transitioned into the next, next century and have to bring those capabilities that make them relevant in the battle space of that century. And then we have to un in, you know, unleash the in incredible innovation of the force. So you have to make sure that inside of our self-talk and the way we lead our own people that we're allowing the future generation to tell us how to best do these things. And they're the ones who are going to tell us. It's not guys on the front row here. It's the young lieutenants and the young lieutenant commanders and the young chiefs and first-class petty officers who are going to say, hey, this is a way to do this. And we have to ensure that we continue to have a force that's vital. I think we do today. I see it from the PACOM commander. I think you're pretty healthy. But I say we have to, have to stay after that. And then for all of you at who's got the next big idea, that's what we're all waiting on. So what's next? What's next? So now we've got littoral combat ship. That's going to roll in. It's got a place in the battle space. We're going to have a legacy force of, of DDGs. The cruisers are going to transition out. Our amphibious force is going to be modernized at whatever pace. But what's the next big idea for surface warfare? What's the next big idea? And then finally, let me close by saying, um, I think that you all should can think about, as you think about uh, both from an industry perspective and a surface warfare leadership perspective, you need to start bringing the calculus of the Indo-Asia Pacific more into your thinking about what it means for the future of the Navy, what it means for the future of the surface warfare Navy. I mean, this is your plum to pick, okay? It's your plum to pick because there are so many opportunities for surface warfare in the battle space that could be defined by the challenges that are in, in the Indo-Asia Pacific and embracing those in your procurement, and embracing them in your training, and embracing them in your future outlook, I think is critical to the success not only of the service Navy, but of our U.S. Navy and our U.S. policy and the interests of the U.S. US uh, American people. So with that, let me stop and see if there's any uh, questions.